Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here this is our new campaign in Equestria War for Hearts of Iron for with a new update called Bears and Bandits 2.1 which we're playing as everyone's favorite bear polar bear nation the polar bear communities led by Paul Wellington and to let you know we are on a historical because I have no idea what's going to happen we're despotists he's a divisive despot that would make a lot of sense um, but we'll have a yearly review for the half decade, the polar bears have been united under the blessed protection of the Paul Wellington. The country has been pushed towards modernity and even perhaps uniformity year by year. Sometime after New Year comes, a newborn bureaucracy would present the report to their despot. The town has come for the fifth such report, the Treasury situation. While the implementation of a modernization programs have been rather so far, that can be carried into the following year. What's important is that we have resources to continue them. It's a good thing, then, that we should still have plenty of resources to push these endeavors forward. <clears throat> Which is a great thing. And the yearly review. Chill spread through the air as Paul Wellington let out a heavy breath. <clears throat> Excuse me. He flipped over another page of the manuscript, looking through the somewhat amateurishly written runes and numbers. He must have typed out text on easy to handle wider yellow paper he would read from during his exile in Griffonia. However, even if it would take time to properly read through the report, the impressions from skimming through were not good. The progress was even slower than the previous year. Less reforms finished, not enough farms and manufacturers finished, and of course, Key Lake plans unsuccessful like always. Is everything to your liking, Elder? The whelp that had delivered the report questioned. Paul had almost forgotten the lesser barrel was there as it waited for any kind of response. Thank you for the concern, but everything is fine. You may go. You may retreat to your quarters. The whelp bowed its head and left the chamber, closing the whalebone door behind it. Wellington laid down the leather manuscript on the iron table and stood up from the chair of bone and chitin. He approached a window of clearest ice and glazed, gazed out into the welcoming blizzard outside. What was the mistake that he was committing? <clears throat> what was the failure? Why were there so many setbacks in his plans to turn the north into a proper state? When Grover the Griffins united his kin, there was nothing like that. The empire he forged in, but less than a decade, stood united and prospered. Of course, Grover had earned the blessing of Boreas, Boreas, Boreas even before his great conquest. Paul scratched his chin. Perhaps all father doesn't find me worthy yet? Request financial support from other clans. Sadly, with quite the quite unexpected material situation of Paul, we're forced to step down from a position at uh, of clan Skyfing, Skyfling superiority and domination request for material support from the other subject, subjugated clans. We can only hope that this does not shatter the image of superiority and even the divine favor we have formed. Cool. Empty cellars. This shouldn't have been a surprise after all. Modernizing an entire country was not something that would have been cheap or easy for one clan. So much steel and coal was required for modernizing production. So much gold was needed to buy Griffin products, uh, which Bear simply couldn't produce yet. A permanent process of modernization for almost half a decade should have been something to be proud of, considering it was all purely on the resources of a single clan. Yet Paul didn't feel pride. If anything, he was angry, though not at his clan after all. Clan Skyfling had done his best it could with the resources available. No, it was mostly angry at himself. He should have ignored how much loot there was left from the Bear Unification. Now, they had only fished left to trade with the world. Iron was too important to give up after all, of course. There was another possibility, something that the elders of other clans most definitely react to with cub-like glee. And sadistically exploit, but which was necessary now that his own clan had nothing left to spare. Let's hope I don't have to break this, break them again for this. So, foreign policy, clans of the north. Many clans make up the polar bear communities, each with their own strengths, weaknesses, and histories. Some are as old as the age of monsters, while others have formed within the last 50 years. But all are proud members of a race, lording over their stats with many of the clanless bears. The clanless bears, in turn, neither envy the clans or mock their self-forged chains. So I might actually read through all these um, slowly, one at a time. Clan Skyfling. <clears throat> the ruling faithful. Any description of modern Usurine society must begin with Paul Wellington. United and despot of the polar bear community. He transformed Skyfling, Skyfling from merely the most religious clan to a modernizing force that dragged us into the 11th century. Before his return from Griffonia, Skyfling's primary rule was to worship the mighty Allfather who uplifted bears from beasts to thinking beings and the great beasts who gave us the important aspects of our society. Great Raven taught us magic, Galimbursti the great boar taught us metalworking, and Fenrir taught us a hierarchy of the strong. Skyfling was changed by the return of the mercenaries and the new Skyfling is still finding its place in history. The Paul is a devout bear, but is also believed in the value of modernity. He brought home a great battleship with it to threaten the vile changelings, and his mercenaries were armed with the best Griffoni had to offer. With his weapons and troops, he made the preparations to finally unite us under one leader. We Svartpels uh, joined his war, and together all fell before a combined might. Now he makes yet more changes to our nations in the name of modernity. He has imported rifles from Nova Griffoni to armor soldiers and tractors from Equestria to aid in the farming of tubers. While many believe him to be a visionary, others fear he is leading us down a truly dark path that will end our soul's connection with the frosty frost forever. Only time will tell if his leadership will end in glory disaster. From history of Polaro, 
Book 185 of the Sfarpel's Archive. Cool. Begin nationalization of farm fish farms. One of the few things, uh, first things Paul Wellington did after his conquest was make the make the ownership of coastal fish farms fairer. In some cases, even distributing clan skyfling fish to less fortunate clans. It was not just an act of kindness, but it also showed power. Whoever controls the fish trade and capture controls the bears, thus we must control most of the fish. Start combining research initiatives. While there's much we can learn about abroad, there's simply similarly much that we can learn from within. Many clans produce and use unique adaptations of various technologies which should be spread to become accessible to all bears. For this noble goal, we shall demand that artisans of other clans are sent to our fortresses and teach us other knowledge so we can spread it across the north. The clans refuse to provide financial support. You can leave now, thanks for bringing the news. Paul Wellington tried to sound as polite as possible as a whelp left the room. He might have been called a desperate or the tyrant, and if his old friends from Nova Grafoni saw him now, they'd definitely say the same, but he remembered their lesson or remembered in Aquilia. To control a large populace, one needed to use both terror and kindness. Only when the whale-born door closed and sealed the chamber shut did the Paul of the clan Skyfling Elder and packed the tables Paul Wellington had allowed his frozen rage to seep out. He knew the elders would receive the request. He knew they had heard what he asked, or what was asked, and required, and he most certainly knew that they had the research to comply with the request. He had spies and informants among the ranks after all, yet almost everyone except the ever-so-dutiful elder Torben of clan Svartpels claimed that the clans had fallen onto hard times and simply didn't respond. It's as if they took him for a fool. Had they forgotten what had happened just half a decade ago? Did they want to grow, go the way of the Rosensverd and Thordensjern? No, perhaps they didn't simply understand the importance of such resources, especially when they were being asked and not forced. Maybe they felt their, uh, felt this helps their rival clans? Or perhaps they felt that this hold was weakening, now they needed their support. All fathers are willing, we shall show them wrong. Clans Farpelts and Anker. <clears throat> the Lords of Thunder and their penguins. It's not difficult to write about yourself, and that's true of a clan as well. Nevertheless, we must try. We far pals are the great resource of Panzersbjorn, where the entire standing army consisting solely of them. We are among the most mightiest warriors and are also keepers of both barren tradition and knowledge. What the races of firewood group together in creature studies are one of our greatest talents. Some will call us conservative or even reactionary, and it's true that we can be we are too slow to accept change. We would reply that change is only rarely an unconditionally good thing. A certain apprehension is wise. We'd also point to Lord Thunder Tordovan's great alliance with the Paul Wellington that brought the bears together under a despot for the first time in living memory. Of Clan Anker, there's little to say. They are sworn of fealty to us and have been since time immemorial. Majority penguin, and they largely went to be left alone to fish uh, the rich waters of the frozen sea. We'd be remiss to leave out a description of Tordovan, as it is a matter of public knowledge that our elders must undergo a ritual of being struck by lightning. It would be no surprise that it was truly an earnest title. He is without a doubt the mightiest bear warrior alive, able to take on any foe and win. He's also a great scholar in his own right, with a deep and profound understanding of the classics and of bear society. His great and true friendship with Pa and his force are more reactionary elements to accept the changes our despot has enacted. His safety for the changings is also unmatched, and he stands ready to lead any warband against them. Hopefully his reign as Thunderlord will be long and secure. No changing perfidity brings him low before his time. From History of Polaria, Book 186 of the Svartpel's Archive. Bar to the Wastes, huh? Berjold of Key Lake. I know I'm saying that wrong. Um, also, we have infantry there to come with, which is not good with artillery, but we also have the Panzerborn. So that's kind of cool. Also, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to keep it on historical or not, but create a united polar bear army. The now military of countries comprised of the clan Skyfling Warblanes. What's a mistake is it seemed to lead to the other nine clans forgetting that they are our subordinates and have their own duties. Perhaps they won't be so willing to forget when it becomes their duty to fight for the country under the leadership of Paul too. Let the waters burn. Uh, Fridjord um, knew he'd be exiled into the waters of Nova Grafonia, where he would perhaps fall prey to cannibals or radicals over this. There was no bear he could even compare in mass combat prowess, and thus stood no chance in a duel. He was but a griffin after all. Born of servants, and even when given a place at the table of the warriors, were being an exception among his kind, he was still not on par, neither in power nor perception by others and those above. However, this also meant that if an owl bear committed a betrayal of such proportions, it would not be blamed on the clan, but rather accusations and retribution that would fall purely on his warband. For most bears still believed that even uplifted griffins couldn't truly persist and understand the nobility, brothered and honor the clan system. It wasn't fair, of course. It wasn't in any way just true. Or just in any way true. It was perhaps even absurd that he was sacrificing the future of his own and others like him, who managed to carve the way up from the mere servants into the warriors. But as a false and fleet burned in the distance, and the plans of the despot of exerting more control over the Westlandian clans was shattered, Fridjof couldn't help but grin. My life for the power of the clan. Destroyed fish farms, well crap. Clan Volsunger. 
Once Volson and Grows the Greatest Rivals of the Sweatfells, we and they clash time and time again, battling for the title of the strongest Yurstein warriors. They led raid after raid into the Yak Mountains, always seeking to expand their holdings during the Unification Wars. They were nearly destroyed after Prince is Ira's return, they were built, but eventually <clears throat> became very different. Her time in the far south had changed during she returned to about Harmonist, espousing the values of Equestria. We were horrified at how much of her old rivals had fallen, but Paul Wellington stopped from expunging this cancer. It decreed that just as our tradition was important to bear kind, so was an inclination towards progress needed to counterbalance it. The fact they brought much knowledge from equestrian technology didn't hurt matters. The later Princess Ira was a skillful warrior and a strategist who once sought to subjugate Westlandia and wipe out Svartfels, but her time in Equestrian and the Crystal Empire left her with a desire to lead the clans towards a harmonious future, where the weak are protected instead of exploited, and a strong role of wisdom and kindness. Well, such a deal seem rather mad to us, who knows what the future will bring. Perhaps one day all bear kind will be united behind her. From History of Polaria, Book 187 of the Svartfels Archive. Cool. Take what we need. If we didn't, if they do not respond to politeness and kind and friendly requests, perhaps they will respond to law and force. We will not ask any more, we will take. The state needs to modernize to survive, and to modernize it needs resources. Scribes and soldiers, and if we have to, all father willing will take what we need with an iron paw. Beneath the mountains, Ira, the princess of Clan Volsunga, surveyed the scribes of the clan Sklyfling that had presented themselves for her. Apparently, Paul Wellington had sent out the close clan, his clan had scientists to teach other clans the advancements he had brought back from his travels in Griponium, and then whatever science and magic that the other clans had created. She couldn't help but notice a rather patronizing tone with the request, especially humorous as a despot referred to his own scientist equivalents, something rather outdated and medieval sounding. <clears throat> Though it didn't matter how Paul Wellington had friendly this request for well, more more order if anything, she knew that it was just another way to attempt to control and stifle other clans. Instead of actually trying to understand or care why everyone except Stark Pels didn't consider him a proper tyrant. Clan of Bolsinger had, uh, had to comply, of course, even if it was more question than polar in character than after Axel. I herself understood and respected the laws of her homeland, but she also understood intricacies of modern politics. She just hoped that the elders of other clans were smart and cunning enough to see the easily exploitable mistakes in how Paul Wellington had worded his order. As the scribe was guided out of the hall to be led to the chambers within the great Bolsinger mountain fortresses where they could rest, I returned to one of her former uh, exile bodyguards and murmured, Keep them occupied with pointless knickknacks as long as we can. We are really hurting ourselves here. <clears throat> and the outcast question. They might act arrogant in a spirit to us, having mocked our pride or dreams and concept of a great united bear state, but we still control the boards and they don't. If we can't get the support and help from bears at home, then we'll just take it from the bears abroad. We'll both the boards and accept the countless exiles that roam the world back home. No honor from them in a war like this. Has he gone truly mad, the great or grand elder us of Clan King growled as one of her own spawn, though with a helmet at war. She couldn't remember which, not that it mattered really at this point, continued describing the sort of absurd, unnecessary, and even treasonous to the bare way of life reforms that Paul Wellington was trying to enforce to the use of new recruitment station staff by the uh, Panzerborn of his own clan. At the very beginning, she was skeptical of such dreams and ambitions of the despot, since, after all, he seemed to be so aligned towards what Griffins and Changelings represented. It's disgusting to say the absolute least for a polar bear to try to, to imitate species so minor and frail. It's why she and Lester Elders agreed to simply ignore the request for the resources to trade. It just tank weakness akin to Griffins and Changelings. Though it seemed that a uh, Skyfling realized their mistake now were demanding, not asking, so at least there was something respectable there. That's okay in humor the request, only to find out of, of this absurdity. The Skyfling were not organizing a force of attack or defense against any sort of attack. They're not even arming weaklings that don't deserve it in the typical fashion for Paul. No, they're trying in fact to forge an army loyal to one bear, Wellington, himself. And with Jodo all duties of tyrant to lesser and lesser to tyrant, the bears of other clans were being forced to train to fight and, not die, and die not for the clan, but for the despot. As a clan that had put their axes down for Paul and those leaders fell beneath his clan, <clears throat> King couldn't just rebel, but his laws and duties were all broken on all levels. King simply couldn't choose to not listen to such orders. Well, King didn't openly announce such defiance, word, rumor, and news traveled by themselves, and soon most other clans had joined in to simply refuse to send bears, send the bears of the clan to serve in the armies organized by Paul. In fact, many seemed to feel so insulted that they stopped patrolling the western borders with the changelings, Something that was previously done willingly, forcing Paul Wellington and Clan Skyfling to compensate with bodies of their own. Oh boy. Clans Falsen, Bradquarb, and Benek Benke Stock. Westlandia, unlike all other regions of the art communities, had no great tradition or ancient clans. Along with minor clans that briefly flickered in existence, they were subjugated or fractured on their own, and then faded away with their culture subsiding into the wider Westlandian way of life. But the current three minor clans, Falsen, Bradquarb, and Abessin Stock, are known to periodically form a defensive pact they call the Triple Alliance. Well, none of these upstarts could change a great clan alone. Together they may well be strong enough to outmatch even a great clan if they ever develop ambition for such a feat. 
Oslandia. It was also notable for the great amount of owl bears. Owl bears are, of course, large and strong griffins who have proven themselves in combat against a bear. Westlandia further has many griffin whelps in servitude to the citizens of the clan. Remnants of attempted invasion by griffin adventurers who seem to be believed in a city made of previous crystal within Yursine, Yursine lands. It is without a doubt the most griffonian region of the community's legends. Legends have it that a millennia ago, two clans known as the Jotnad monster kings were ruled over Westlandia and the lands east of it, and they were expunged from the world by invading forces, if true. Ruins of these long gone clans may be found in the frontier. In any case, Westlandia, or Westlandians, live among ruins and trash, erecting new fortresses and factories instead of trying to rebuild ruined holds. Paul Wellington's industrial plans have found great success there, but the support of these clans is hardly a glowing endorsement. With luck, the Triple Alliance will collapse under its own weight, and they'll be easy prey for better years' scenes. From History of Polaria, Book 188 of the Sparkpills Archives. Cool. And we have three more to read, too. Are we building anything? No. Well, that's a mistake. But it's not that like we can build anything anyways. The Warlords. Ant Alartir is home to three warlord clans, the Rosencrans, Cain, and Gollum. Rosencrans is closely connected to the countless roaming shamans, they who can look into the north of the wind and use the frost to heal wounds or even see the past or future. <coughs> Cain are the only rivals we fight the palace have for the mightiest wars, and it's true that they are extremely ferocious and often reaching truly absurd sizes exceed even many Svartpel's bearers. The ability to craft thunder armor and weapons against it are often lacking, however, and got long our masters of defense, being unusually centralized into a single impregnable hold that extends underground in proportions and Titanic can have to hold its entire tuber gardens within. Great Os of Cain is mother to countless many warriors and unmatched in her arrogance as well. The name of Sham King of Rosencrantz is isolationist and cautious, benefiting one who can see across the ages. And unconventionally, Gotlung is not ruled by a single elder, but by council of them, which votes on all issues to determine the direction the clan will take, which, combined with the mindset of the clan, merely leads them to a continued fortification to the lands rather than direct action. Each of these clans is small and likely a little threat to the great clan, but even smart bells would struggle to outmatch one of these clans in the area of its expertise. What their place would be in the future of our race remains uncertain, but should Paul retain them on his side, we are, we are likely to see a good destiny of unbreachable defense. A my shock troops thundering across the north. From 189. Book 189. The Greatest Betrayal. Paul Wellington roared into the air, frozen air streaming toward outwards from his jaws. He stole through the manuscript, scratching the steel table beneath it. This was absurd, outrageous, and extremely uncharacteristic for a species. At first, they displayed an almost griffin like ability to reinterpret it, the orders and demands he had sent out. Then they, in a fashion more similar to the changings than any other species and just how disgusting it was, backstabbed and betrayed him in an absurd acts of self destructiveness by destroying their own farms and fleets as if they just to spite him. But those actions were nothing compared to this. To think the panzerborn of one's tyrant, uh, without a proper reasoning, was breaking any and all laws by the All Father. This was a betrayal greater than what he killed. It, what had killed entire clans. They would have to be punished. Seven other clans had to be punished in some way. But when uh, Pa thought about what sort of brutality would have had to be invoked as a show, uh, show of power in such a situation, no, we couldn't do something like that. Perhaps he had gone too soft or too weak. He assumed Torben would do it without thinking too much. But con con contemplating such mass destruction, even in a state of such rage, made him pause. There to be some other way. Paul went to an elf, uh, beneath an ancient statue dedicated to the All Father. A creation of frozen stone, shaped into a strange yet awe-inspiring bear-like armored beast, was marking the midpoint of a road between Clan Skyfling and the countless clans that used to exist on the western side of the Key Lake. However, now is used as an indication of land where the rule of the Hive of Storth began. Paul Wellington would travel to this moment monthly, where, monthly whenever he could, both to give his respects for the great divinities and to visit the few fortresses remaining here that kept watch so that Chrysalis didn't get any ideas. It would have been nice to visit other similar fortifications scattered across other empty borderlands across all of the polar bear owned north. A realization dawned for Paul Wellington, a show of power that other, other clans would be forced to respect, something which could also be considered a true punishment for all the wrongdoings. He gazed upon the pseudo Yurserine statue again. Thank you, All Father. Who needed political power or anything like that? I got to Madrid too. Rosenberg and Totenzian, but the invention of the fighter plane. Elric strapped the light flight goggles, goggles onto his head and clambered roughly under the big plane. He whispered a quick prayer to the All Father for success and started the engine. A warm war rock answered him and he grinned. With a few more switches flipped, he took off into the air. Look at that. He looked at the targets below and squeezed a pair of buttons tightly. Uh, a sputter of machine gun fire hurled down towards the stationary targets and he burst out laughing. It was like a whole squadron of words had torn them apart. It was far better than just the scouting of the changing butcher's float plane. The glided care plane hopped out of the plane. Paul was there to greet him. That was a spectacular despot say with a broad smile. Well done, my friend. Ulrich uh, shook his paw. The changing are not going to like this, he replied with a smirk. They'll think they'll get to rule the skies alone. While well, today, polar airspace is officially ours. Two friends shared a hearty laugh. Nice. 
Rosenzvard and Tottenzian. Not every clan is uh, defeated in the unification war deserved a place in Paul Wallingham's society. Two clans from the shores of Key Lake, Rosenvard and Tordensjern faced exile for the cooperation with the hated changelings. Before their fall, Rosenvier were the clan most interested in the innate magic of crystals. They are obsessed with modernization as well and worked with the changelings for nearly a century. Though little is known of their current activities, scattered rumors report that they have become fixated on technology and the fusion of air and machine. Their leader, Overstad, Overstad, uh, Administrator 001 is believed to have combined machine magic and bear into one physical abomination. Dorden Zierne was once a second clan of shamans. They had a deep and uh, abounding interest in metals deemed worthless by the bears, especially gold. When they were exiled, they took the gold with them, and if the wildest rumors would be to believe, they took control of the star steel. What is known as the day of the claim to synthesize a sort of star steel like alloy, and their Lord Midas desires ever more gold for this purpose. For now, though, the two exiled clans bide their time in the changing lands. If all goes well, we'll never see them again, and they'll either be destroyed or return to savagery like the bears on the northern, saddening shore. But this story may not be over yet. From Book 190, and the question of the outcasts. Of course, even if we were to start taking an outcast of substantial numbers, in an attempt to understand or undermine the power of our subordinate clans, we still have to decide how far we will go, of course. After all, if a bear is exiled out of any lands, inhabited by his kinds, and so simply his own clan, <clears throat> Then they must be quite the radical, and in some cases even transgressors against all laws, mortal and spiritual. Perhaps many of them have reformed in exile. Perhaps they have dropped their absurd and immoral, amoral ideas that they fought and fell for. However, we can never be sure, especially considering how long polar bears can hold down their own ideals, even during the darkest days of exile. Paul Valentin knew, of course, being one of such dishonored and radical exiles, who was being banished, who kept up his ideals of modernization and adaptation of Griffin-like methods for decades. However, even if we're doing this in what is a clear insult, an attempt to show power over other clans, it would perhaps be wise to not anger them too much. Perhaps limiting ourselves at the least dangerous groups would show both their power and dominance when it comes to where it matters to the other clans while also not causing too much outrage. On the other Paul, we can simply accept everyone back and hope that when the conflict arises we have new recruits, enough of them, that we're simply numerous enough so that no other clan thinks they can win, however, taking the more radical option could lead to losing our only currently infirm ally, Lord Thurban of Clan Svartbells. Limit ourselves. All bears are welcome back, and those without a clan. From the clanless bears who chose to were forced into a life of freedom, uh, to wander, the wandering nomads of the frontier, to the brutal savages of the changing lands, a great mass of bears do not live in a clan. There are many of them, but they tend to be more compliant than the clans, going along with the uh, along with the wishes of whatever uh, your scene rules the region they dwell within, and offering services as generals and advisors with little care for ideology or doctrine. Uh, these bears are generally inspired by the most brutal wars of your scenes, which has led to some cynics to mutter that no matter who wins wars among earth scene kin, the true winners are those without a clan. The clan's bears of communities and lands nearby are those who are expelled or never part of a clan. They usually operate in independent war bands or holes, free from the constraints of a clan's rules, yet also devoid of the protection and sense of unity clan offers. They are brought together by a strong figure and are usually dispersed once that figure dies. There is a million of them, and perhaps more, yet the very sense of individuality that defines them prevents them from ever rising to conquer the clan bears. The nomads, those without a home or culture, are most concentrated on the frontier and the borderlands of Nova Kryponia, but can be found nearly anywhere across the north. According to legends, they are descendants of the long gone Jotnar monster kings and direct inheritors to the legacy of pre clan nomadic monster armies. Though this were true, they would largely be aware of the, un unaware of this. One possible exception is a communist revolutionary ice bear who is generally believed to be a nomad with uncanny intelligence and cunning. Of the savages of the clan changing lands, most commonly found in the northern Sadening or saddening ashore in nearby mountains and forests. There's little to say, they live like beasts, mauling and devouring anything they need to survive. Their weapons are primitive and many are unable to, or unwilling to produce armor, relying on magics to cut themselves on layers of ice. While they may be brutes, they are still your scenes that we cannot help but feel kinship to them. Perhaps one day, when the perfidious changings are defeated and grovel for mercy, we will unite with our lost kin. From History of Polaria, Book 191. Insanity. The news spread like a lightning, of course, for even on tamed land without proper roads and communication, as was the intent. Across the polar bear inhabited lands, clans reacted in absolute disbelief as they learned of what had happened, and they rose in revolt. Paul Wellington had been testing their patience for a long time, but this was pure insanity, which should have never been allowed in the first place. And a giant fortress beneath uh, the mountains that stretched across lands of yaks and bears and even griffins. The princess of uh, clan of Olsengar started marshalling her forces to save her kind from this mad tyrant, and preventing the nightmare that would rise from this, near the northern shores. Uh, even where the most hardiest of beasts couldn't endure the brutal winds, a lord of lightning and thunder shook the news of the new order in disbelief. His friend could never be bad. Man, could he? No. A smell of conspiracy and uh, smell of foul and disgusting. A smell of bugs doing what other creature could have manufactured something so insulting yet destructive. They must have done this because they're afraid. They must have known what awaited the wretched kind of the north was truly united. 
but they would not be allowed to win, and thus the Lord of Thunder, two races forces, depleted as his clan was from the years of war. Of course, the Despot himself realized that now they'd ruin his dream, uh, that he would now have to put down every clan, armored himself with the grim determination and an idea of a salvation and marshaled his forces. I do what must be done. The other clans deny Paul Bellingham's rightful rule of the lands and near scenes and enforce our realm into the second age of strife. Even if we must force the second war of unification, clan Skyfling, Paul Bellington shall be victorious again. Supremacy, harmony. I kind of want to go supremacist, but let's go. Let's keep with uh, not a line. I do what must be done. We will not yield. We will not surrender. It's been less than a decade. Once, yet once more, clan is pitted against the rest of our kind. But just like the last time, the all fathers willing, we will not surrender or yield until all the polar bears are yet again united by clan Skyfling. Storm of Fortresses. Well, Storm of Fortresses. While most of the Northwest Bears lands are owned and controlled by the Sky Clan Skyfling, or Bears lacking clan alignment, there's still quite a few locations where the claws of Onlantir or Westlandian clan stretch among what is ours. We must ensure we won't be struck in the back and thus our castles and forces must fall. We will not yield. Oh, I can't even like increase the size or anything like that. Darn it. Such chaos, such devastation. Yet, again, we were bears tearing to each other in open war, even worse than before. Paul Wellington had no all duties, alliances, and tyrants subjugated to connections between any and all clans. But surprisingly, you know that all clans are compiled, no, are compiled to the demand. However, the horror unleashed by this untamed wild war torn into this very being. It was a result of what all had been done, all of his mistakes. In front of his clan, he continued looking stern and strong as they gathered for war, but on the holy grounds, he felt so weak, so confused. So what had he had done? A turn of the great Emperor Grover I and II, something also tapping into the successes of Liberator Alexander Kamersky. Had this been wrong inspirations, had he, not, had he not noticed something integral? Perhaps we should have taken Torben seriously back then, when the Lord of Thunder joked that he had become too griffinized for his own good, too ignorant of clan systems, and too adamant in his ideas of superiority, that he needed allies and subjects. Perhaps that might have saved him then, but now, now it seemed that they were, there was only war. What do I do now? War with local alliances. There are many forts or I Ice forts and even larger fortresses that are inhabited not only by the great clans, but rather by lesser outcasts or those whose bloodlines never belonged to any clan. We previously mostly ignored their interests and part to play in the United Bear State, however, they can still be fixed. Well, this can still be fixed. Putting a polar bear in a plane, huh? Can't quite do that yet. But eventually, that'd be kind of cool. Go on to the fortresses. Oh god, technology is so bad for us. Restore the fish farms. The stored and set Dutch fish farms have been a bit of an issue we have neglected to address due to uh, an ever increasing issues before the collapse, however. We can't afford to do that any longer. The fish farms all across our own land must become operational again so we may never find ourselves lacking. Finish the reclamation of the Northwest. Fish are being caught in great numbers again. Larger and larger armies are being raised, and any presence of other clans that present a danger to us has been eliminated. Now we can march outwards. Ah. Oh, a lot of naval XP every day, huh? Nice. I don't want to give more army XP, maybe. Air XP is not bad, but I want army XP. March West. The fact that there was anything left that could revolt in an eastern key lake after the clans that persisted there were pushed out into the changing lands for their treason is quite surprising. Reclaiming it should not be an issue. Get more stability, which is good. 10,000 more pony power is good. Doesn't help political power, though, but, you know, I guess 10% political uh, stability is better than no stability, I suppose. Nice. Turn our gaze south. Yeah, let's go south. Onkelartier is an unforgiving land, distant from the nourishing sea and even most rivers or lakes. Though its long history has been invaded by changing royal rogue yak war bands or other bear clans, and a few failed griffin expeditions. No wonder such lands have bred three entire clans of fearsome warriors. Destroy clan king. Well, we've let them all back home, so we'll probably destroy them. Minor clans of the south. For as long as all the scriptures of both bear and foreign origins have recorded, our race has always been one of the warriors and mo warmongers. We've waged war on earth, or on each other, and on yaks, when, and when changes and griffins pushed into our frozen realm, we fought them too. Some even say that we have waged war on the land itself, as we had to fight both the climate and the beast before we tamed even our own homeland. 
Our very society has been defined by the struggle. Every leader, every influential figure, even the greatest and most revolutionary smiths and scribes have been great fighters for only though through combat can one show the strength of their ideas to their betters. Yet, yeah. even among a society that glorifies war so much, three clans of Olantir are considered above and beyond what it came to militarism, for it was them who stood for centuries as a wall against rogue Yak Khans and changing hordes, all while continuing a seemingly internal conflict between each other. It had been perhaps a good thing that the land was as desolate and unfitted to sustain life as a game, for at all Olantir, clans up in the least numerous ones. One of them would certainly uh, overrun the far north before Paul Wellington had returned from exile. But even with their lacking numbers, the subjugation of the all Olantir clans was the most difficult of campaigns during the first unification, and took the entire might of both clans, Skyfling and Svetfels, something which would be impossible to repeat now. Yet here we are now, destroy the clan. Kane may result in the inst inability to access certain content, though perhaps as the machine of death grinds onward, a darker path can be taken. There's nothing no one will do, but it must be done. The great warriors of can Clan Cain will be slain to the last by our mind. None shall survive to resist, only Gutton will res result. Destroy a Clan Gutlum. What if you destroy all the clans? As brutal and wasteful, perhaps even absurd, but there's no other choice left to us. The great walls of Gutlum will collapse under their own, burying all beneath them, leaving only a hundred ruins behind. Cain destroyed. As an outcome, the warlords of Clan Skyfling, and especially Paul Valentine, would have not expected. Instead of waiting for an onslaught from the superior numbers, Clan Cain had chosen to raise their forces and strike first, and thus two armies met on the frozen field. In any case, one would be forgiven, presuming that even if Clan Cain was outnumbered three to one, their superior combat ability and the element of surprise could have allowed for a stalemate or an unexpected victory. After all, Clan Cain it was famous or even infamous for the size and strength of their warriors. Had this been a traditional engagement, Clan Cain would have charged unto their enemies, seeking to overwhelm them through sheer number of force, or what could have been likened to an avalanche of angry armored beasts. All the while, said enemy would be bombarded with either cannons or close to sing to uh, machine guns that was available. Something which was to his engage engagement, the clan force was lacking. If one subscribed to the traditional bare sense of honor, clan Skyfling would not have used their own heavy weapons. Yet it had been decided by Paul Wellington that this would not be allowed to be a traditional engagement. It was not a part of war. It was part of extermination, and for this duty, something never before seen or even imagined for the most bears, and most likely not widely seen even among changes and griffins, hunting rifles meant to be taking down dragons. Barely a dozen of such weapons were available to Clan Skyfling, yet they were the turning point. The very first volley tore through the Clan Cain avalanche, which was then hit by artillery. After that, it was a slaughter. With the greatest wars, and even their elders gone, the slain, perhaps quite unfairly in battle, forces didn't hold for much long either. They were rather quickly turned into nothing more than butcheries. Only some of the whelps or cubs were spared, cubs were spared but they were too young or too lacking intelligence and physical might to cause any danger or hold any grudge, and so such was the end of Clan Cain, and just like Grover the Second. Destroy Clan Rosenkrantz. If the machine of death grinds onward, a darker path can be taken. What is this darker path? Let me know in the comments below. The northern lands, or winds howl and fire will roar, but the blizzard of Rosenkrantz's shama shamanic might will go out. An entire legacy snuffed out, leaving them a message of the ha hail is impossible to comprehend. Got them destroyed. The walls were larger than before, more prepared, not just ice this time, but stone, even steel. Clan. Gotlum hadn't forgotten their humiliation they had prepared. Paul Wellington engaged with the fortress seemingly, but built to stop another skyfling march against the closest thing Clan Gotlum had to a capital. The despot of the polar bears let a heavy sigh. This was far easier indeed, but less, far less costly than it would be any other way, yet also much more brutal and disrespectful for the dead. Clan Gotlum had thought they had made an unbreakable fortress, yet they had done nothing more than prepare themselves for a masquerade. Artillery, explosives, and a few dozen anti dragon rifles, and even, uh, Improvised flamethrowers, all unleashed the fury on the walls of what any other bear force would have seen as the greatest of modern fortresses. Perhaps it had it been any other force with any other intent, they would have stopped their bombardment after a few days, but maybe they would give up after the dozenth time a Gotlung Ponzebjorn had sallied out of the fortress, crushing through sky fleeing forces. But Paul Wellington and his forces were here with a grim purpose and they would not retreat. And eventually the fortress collapsed, segment by segment, wall by wall, bearing the best and brightest of the clan beneath it. Some tried desperately to escape, only to perish against far superior numbers. The greatest fortress of Clan Gotland was gone, and many lesser followed. Rosencrantz destroyed. Polar bears didn't like living on high mountains. The terrain was dangerous, and the winds and storms could overpower even the greatest of Ursines. Local beasts were simply dangerous, uh, similarly dangerous, and even more being ma more magical than flesh due to the closeness to the power of Northern Lights. Yet it was from the top of the tallest mountain in Onlatir on that the Shaman Lord of Rosencrantz gazed upon the untamed power within the heavens. Holy crap. And it was at the very mountain top, where an entire legacy is finally snuffed out. Clan the Orozenkrans was the only one among the clans of Olantir, whose capital fortress was not in a somewhat easily accessible location, rather the Skybreaker Peak was surrounded by lesser fortifications on all sides, which had been taken out or at least tied up in combat before one could march on the sky-rendering mountain itself. And thus the entire elder and leader generation of the clan was slowly pushed back while being forced to watch as the entire clan was obliterated, bit by bit. 
and they channeled any and all magic to know the forbidden forces available to them, and yet this was not enough, and eventually it all came to the peak word itself, where the name of the shaman lord fell beneath the claws of Paul Wellington and his be best pans of yarn, and shamans were crushed under the power of the dozen griffins made anti-dragon rifles that Clan Skyfling had brought up from this height for the sole duty of extermination. Well, only survivors. Uh, clan Rosencrantz's extermination was too young or too low on the clan hierarchy due to lacking magical or ta combat talent. The clan didn't keep any records beyond the oral ones. Of many similar clans being exterminated or made outcast during the last unification, the shaman tradition of polar bear was of God was gone. All, all, all Father, forgive us. The south is ours. On Lartir, rest beneath the banner of Skyfling again, just like it did recently, however. The now land of proud warriors and great shamans is truly devoted to a cause, something which we were unable to ensure the last time through our foolishness. But now we can be sure that there won't be any more revolts. Much better. Oh, let's see. Oh, book unlocks unit training and template modifying. Oh, thank God. Turn against east, unexpectedly. And perhaps in a surprise to not just us, but everyone else across the Bear Lands, the three clans of plentiful Westlandia have aligned with each other, forging a sort of alliance and equals. Such a system has never been seen before among the pairs, and let's hope that it has its faults, for if Westlandia truly rises united, who simply not have the numbers to stand a chance. Well, at least that's better for us. Well, butch of the Triple Alliance. Westlandia is united by itself, rose from the formerly rival clans. They resisted us before, but now, with all that we've done, they would never accept our rule, and we can never contain them. Only one option is left, to snuff out the entire region. Let's hope the gods forgive us, because we can never forgive ourselves. The Great Alliance of the East. Westlandia has always been the region of polar bear lands, which is the most strange and wondrous for the bears, yet perhaps the most normal for most creatures that do not thrive in winter and cold. Its forests are plentiful of both berries and game, and stretch on seemingly forever. The game itself is rather more similar to the one we would see in a normal forest of northern Griffonia, or even Severa, uh, Severiana, instead of the strange half. Uh, magical beasts that roam most of the land. Even the land itself is incredibly fertile. Bears bearing tubers and plenty of other mostly edible, if bland and long-growing, arctic plants. Even the northernmost area sea seems to be most plentiful in the fish and seal near the region. Yet despite all this, no great clan or great world that arose in this clan as clans instead of growing to eclipse all others, would shatter over access to the best fishing or farming spots, even to face a potential conquest and annihilation. At the hands of the Nova Griffonian expeditions, clans didn't unify, merely reclaiming large chunks of land where griffins had begun to settle as their masters in the west were simply unable to administer it properly, and generally would be conquered into nothing more than servants for their Eurstein overlords. Currently, the land is occupied by three clans, Falson. Uh, Back at Stock and Broadcorp, all of which are merely a few decades old as they were the result of yet another cycle of a clan growing in power until it shatters. But this time, it seems it took longer for unique traditions to develop as the three clans all use Griffin servants and primarily share traditions with the exception of Falson, whose members seem to be fascinated with sea and shipbuilding. Perhaps it's these reasons for why the leaders of the clan managed to so easily agree between themselves to forge an alleged alliance of equals, something that has never been seen before among bears. Similarly, worrying, our uh, clans of this triple alliance a desire to use their power over the bears themselves. We need to read carefully here. Scavenger and Fortress Buster. Logistics would probably be good. Let's go with logistics. And honestly, we be offensive. No peace, no honor. The Triple Alliance is perhaps the most numerous, and even some might say the most powerful factions within the Ursine territories. It may have been true if one is simply judged by numbers, yet for all their numbers of bears and technological and strategic edge, and were not allowed to... Oh, and all potential forces raised from the Griffin Servants' cast, they lacked the technological and strategic edge, and were not allowed to realize that this was not a typical bear conflict of tradition, honor, and melee prowess, rather, it was a war extermination. And thus, they were not simply... were not, and simply could not be ready for the weapons that were deployed against them. Their armor and barricades stood no chance against rifles, if weapons of such scale could even be called that. Men just like dragons. The Griffin's auxiliaries, even if they had grown to be able to must sustain the great colds of polar bear lands, still lacked the natural cold of their masters and the great feathers and furs they were clad and caught fire rather easily when rather primitive flamethrowers were deployed against them. Out of the foremost clans, it came time for the countless fortresses and other various locations that belonged to the clans, which were now left woefully lacking any possible defenses. The purges of the Triple Alliance forts, where they were even more pitiful than the slaughter of the front lines, even caused some skyfling to question the righteousness of the cause and the sections of Paul Wellington, of course. None of them dared to disobey or challenge the desperate of his great warriors to a duel. The final remnants of the Westlandian clans at the fronts of the clan, Skyfling, and the clan Svartfeld lasted the longest, yet surrounded on all sides, and the homes destroyed, they didn't stand a chance. The greatest of her sins. The East is ours. The plentiful and great Westlandia now rests beneath their claws. Despite its recent unification into a force which might have challenged and even defeated us, the All-Father did not bless us, and we were the ones who emerged... Uh, had they not blessed us, we were the ones who emerged triumphant against what would, in any other case, be impossible odds. And even this time, our grip will be persisting for sure. We do what we must. Oh, okay. 
Daily compliance, that, that's interesting. Uh, I'm gonna go I'm gonna put it the power. Not even one a day yet, but prepare for the final, final push. We might have eliminated the threat the lesser clans have posed for us, and yet to confront the great clan of Bolsungar and the fearsome clan Starkbells, we will need to prepare as much as possible. Or raise new forces and fortify our new borders in preparation for retribution and a great push. Question of Clan Bolsungar. Clan Bolsungar squads perhaps the most the anomaly within the polar bear territories. They used to be a rival to our former comrades in the Spark Palace, which meant they during the previous unification that they lost extremely brutally. This forced them to accept many outcasts, which changed them, transformed them, even. It's difficult to even think about the best way to deal with them now. Bombard Bolsungar Mountain holds dead dust. What we have done? With what we have done, the question copycats that our clan Bolsungar would never align with us and never submit to us. The only way to ensure an army, enemy armies are hiding in these mountains is to collapse them onto the Volsinger forts with them. Let's hope the fort, forge feature is bright enough to justify this. A darker path could be taken. The Harmonists in the mountains. The clan Volsinger was often historically seen. If the stories of the oldest among the ranks of polar bears and passed down legends were to be believed, as a distant, strange, and even disgraceful and dishonorable clan. This is in no small part due to the fact that the clan didn't even have a tradition of armored warriors, and they seem to have never used a traditional large axes, the weapon that any proper polar bear warrior would carry as their primary armament until the last few decades. Rather than the greatest warriors were so-called nanooks, hunters that preyed on the magical beasts that filled the mountain ranges. Furthermore, instead of dwelling within fortresses of stone and ice forged in unforgiving ways, Volsunga would hide within the depths of the mountains as if surrounding or surrendering to the elements in a manner more fitting for diamond dogs than any of the proper year scenes. Yet there were two reasons for this. Why? Despite all the rumors and disbehavior, nobody dared to challenge Volsinger's right to exist. Firstly, despite not using the traditional polar bear weapons, the clan possessed several entire halls of star steel armor and weapons within their unbreakable mountain home. Secondly, Clan Volsinger had a long history of both friendship and ritualized wars with the Yak clan south of Yersin land. As the Yaks were one of the few species which polar bears respected and thought as close to themselves as spirit, a friendship with their clans were a clear indication of being proper polar bears to many. Or proper bears. Only the history of obsessed clan Svartpels denied such notions to wage a war many war against Volsinger, though mostly without success. That could change during the first bear unification, as an alliance of Skyfling and Svartpels brutalized the clan, and even some grew to believe that this would lead to its extinction, yet endured, by using a method which others would have considered too much, accepting back countless exiles without having to withstand a trial by combat. Even the current leader, the so-called Princess Ira, was a former exile who, during her exile, traveled through Equestria and copied many of their ways. This has put both her and Clan Bolsinger in opposition to us politically, even before they never showed it to in the almost in the open and mostly seemed to ignore us, and now they march against us in war. Why would we want to copy Equestrian weakness? The Yak Mountains are ours. The mountains that separate our lands from the Yaks are said to be uh, impossible to break through and fight in, yet our advance against Bolsinger, we have subjugated these great mountains too. Question of Clan Svartpels. Clan Svartpels were the most faithful allies during the first unification, furthermore their elder, the Lord Storms. Of Storms, Torben, was good of a distant friend of Paul Wellington, yet now we send a pose. The mountains turn to dust. Previous plans <clears throat> uh, of subjugation and destruction of one thing was seen as the most certain in any engagement between Clan Skyfling and would be opponents from the uh, 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 Polar Bear lands. The, that the forces under Paul Wellington would possess either technologically superior equipment or possess them in good enough numbers. This didn't seem to be the case for Volsinger, which seemed to possess weapons similarly advanced and even something superior. Their armored self propelled sleds were especially powerful weapons, being impossible to penetrate with most weapons, only concentrated artillery or heavy anti dragon rifles could shatter the advances of these weapons. And Volsinger seemed to possess something that could match these weapons in range of power too. For the first time in almost a decade, the position of power was almost flipped, somewhat flipped. And yet, despite technological superiority, most of the weapons under possession of Volsinger were rather limited in availability. The clan itself was also lacking in numbers compared to the forces amassed by Paul Wellington at this point, and thus, it was, even if it was slow, and many of the more advanced and exotic contraptions had to be taken down with numbers, Bolsinger was pushed into the defensive position. Eventually, any and all fortresses and outposts outside the main Bolsinger hold were broken and shattered, the defensive weapons being becoming more of a liability than an advantage. Of course, storming the mountains themselves and trying to engage the Bolsinger within the caves and underground in which they thrive would have been suicidal, yet, while the fortress itself was impossible to take for any force that wasn't absolutely overwhelming, in this case, it didn't matter if the fortress was actually taken. It, was only, it only mattered that Bolsinger would fall, and thus any and all entrances were bombed until they collapsed inward. The clan would, put, would perish in holes they dug out themselves. No way in, no way out. Thunder and lightning will not save them. With how much they seem to be convinced everything is bad a conspiracy of changing things, they will never simply accept what we did or why. There's an immense grief in having to turn on old friends, yet for the future of the bear kind it has to be done. We do what we must. It is not because we want to do it, but because we have to. Ah! So much for equestrian love and magic. 
The Lords of Thunder. A glance sparked Bell, the Lords of Thunder, as they were known sometimes by fearful enemies, was a rather unique contradiction, as if one tried to per perceive them through a gripping and perhaps pointy lens. But it was one of the most intellectual and scientifically aligned clans, at least before the Volsungar started welcoming outcasts back in mass, yet also one of the most warlike and reactionary when it came to advancements. The ritual of induction into the ranks of the Pazin, its Pazin, Panzerbjorn and leadership was the most brutal, as it included not just slaying beasts or winning a trial by combat, but as a proof of yet strength. One was supposed to be struck by lightning and endure, yet simultaneously. The same induction ceremony questioned the would-be warriors or a leader's knowledge of their history, tradition, and what amounted to be traditional sciences and crafts. Clan Svartpels was also heavily opposed to many ideas on change and investments suggested by the younger generations. Being the main source of bears cast out from the further north, yet when the prosper uh, proposed that such changes have proven their worth in combat. They would willingly, happily follow the changes. Such was the case when Paul Wellington managed to earn the friendship through a duel by defeating their leader, the great Thunder, Lord Torben. After this, Clan Svarth Pals assisted us in the unification of polar bear lands. The support continued even through our most controversial and in retrospective absurd decisions, and yet now they stand against us. It's not for reasons one would think, for Clan Svarth Pals and Torben turn against us, not because they believe that we have broken our duties or committed some great sin. It seemed that for some reason or the other, Torben and his entire clan believes that these actions were not of Paul Wellington and his clan, rather it's either changing a conspiracy of spreading lies or misinformation and shattering bear unity and causing conflict. In fact, they're so adamant in the belief that any bear could even wishes to approach a member of the clan is forced to engage in a duel, as is widely believed that even if changing were able to masquerade as something comparing to our size, such form is not possible to maintain it in combat. That might be quite an issue, but the North is peaceful. Even the Great Northern Shores now bend to the will of Paul Wellington and Clan Skyfling, Truly, we can yet again reach a claw across the unbearable domain. Our future should be blessed by the frost and spirits of our ancestors. We'll be able to get rid of our literacy, finally. Thank God. Thunder will never be heard again. Perhaps this was the hardest thing uh, that Paul Wellington had done before. Maybe that's not a literal sense. It's a literal sense as well. As well, Clan Svartpels was indeed a fearsome opponent. With their minds set to the destruction, this war was not contested or even seemed to be turned towards the Lords of Thunder. What was hard for many, including bears, was having to destroy your friends and long-term allies due to conflict over your own actions. Actions that you couldn't take back and the actions that they simply wouldn't accept. Yet it had to be done for a greater future, for a greater chance of polar bear survival as a state. And thus, uh, even if it was painful, it had to be done. So a Skyfling deployed against Svartpels in full force. Skyfling had technological, numer numerical, and strategic superiority, but this didn't mean that the Lords of Thunders went down quietly. They fought and bled or perished, yet crushed many a warband, often in spite of a ranged weaponry which would have crushed any other force. And yet, despite such victories, they couldn't replace their losses, for there were so few Svartpels, yet there were so many bears under Paul Wellington. And eventually, despite how much they raged and fought, the fortresses were crushed, and the wards and elders hunted down, and whoever remained was pushed into the sea. Only Blizzard rules in the north now. We have done what we must, and a Skyfling victory. Yet again, for the second time in less than a decade, Clan Skyfling under Paul Wellington stands as uh, undisputed leaders of the polar bear race, and this time our dominion is unquestionable. Nice! God, I want to play as Confederates. Oh my god. I just hear the sound of Dixie playing in the background. Huh. Caught one being party. Yeah, I definitely have to play this sometime. The first southern election. So I don't know which one's better. These are Pansy Born, and they're not special forces, are they? Infantry is just worse overall, so we actually might just want to use uh, infantry or the Skyfling Panzer and Bjorn. They seem more fun, but they do cost more to use. No, no, let me know in the uh, comments below. And illiteracy, with the clans united by the fair means or foul, we can now roll out a conference of education reform system across America? No, they don't. Okay. Oh my god. Look at this tree. So you have a change of pace. We negotiated with them. Interesting. A rising kingdom. Army of Winter. Because eventually we could have withdrawn our paws under Borealis. Resettle our own lands. The Anker Experiment. Getting some more cores. This is our last war against changing. So that's cool. Railways are iron claws. Shoulder to shoulder is one. Oh, that's cool. And then we have a true army over here. And this way is mass assault, huh? That's cool. 
and build up the northern industry. Clan Blaze, Blaze Base, integrate clan economics. Update industry sector. Huh. It'll extreme the dream, but and this is a despot with a soft paw. The confederation. So for that one, you had to do uh, negotiated successfully. It sounds like a difficult thing to get all these guys to do that together. Meeting of the greats. Guarantee the Griffin Republic. Oh. But we're going to go with the Great Over Tyrant. We have won through blood and iron, through iron, ice and fury. Victory, the final total victory is finally ours. From now on, no one will dare to question the might and the will of a great over tyrant of the year scenes. Now the transformation of our state into a modern power can begin. Our clean land. Or so it seem. Four reports have started coming in. Warring reports that describe the situation that has befallen many of the fortresses that we cleanse from enemies. Perhaps we might have overdone ourselves. Oh. Oh, it literally just gets rid of the other focus tree. That's actually super nice. That's actually really awesome. I love that the devs did that. Because as much as I want to look at the other trees, it's so nice that it just cleans things up. The empty ice. Paul Wellington gazed out over the forests and tundras of his homeland. It had always been inhospitable, with the bears needing to spend most of their efforts simply to survive. In the face of the Arctic cold, everything else made sense. Why had they never built a great empire like the Griffins? Why they had prized strength and clan above all? The fridge of wind howling across their homeland unanswered. And so it was that Paul Wellington came to understand. He understood now the wise bears finally united under a single overtime, and regress back to the state where they'd been in when they first arrived. All his work, undone in a few months of bloodshed, and it, which had forced the remaining bears to devote all the energies to basic survival. Paul Wellington started sending out new orders to take stock of what was left to start rebuilding, but there was little heart to it. He had failed when he had all, had all clans behind him. He had little hope left that he would succeed now alone. Will we ever rebuild him? Clan of Skyfling. We lose a divisive despot. Ooh. Well, I can't spend any political power. We gain defeatist. Oh, God. And cornered Fox. Okay, interesting. And our shattered clans, even more worrying news approaches. For a while, rebellious identities in opposition for any unity towards a singular future is gone. Similarly, gone are all the brightest minds in most, most clans and many collections of writings. Soon, in many scientific fields, we have to start from the bottom. Oh boy. Buried hopes. Beneath the rubble of the fortresses lay of the, of the clans, uh, lay the hopes of the polar bears for the better future. The fortresses and proto factories over tyrant Paul Wellington had poured loot from his countless years as a mercenary into encouraging were buried beneath incalculable tons of rock. We were yet the very exiles whose return he had hoped would drag the other clans to the future had, for the most part, chosen to perish with their clans. Good God. Over tyrant Paul Wellington tried to rage at their foolishness, but his rage had run out. He could only be angry at himself, or thinking that the other clans would be cowed, or that he could wipe them out without losing the very minds he needed to build a new future. More exiles kept returning, but most were broken souls and bloodthirsty criminals. Violent beasts, even by Eurasian standards. These were not the minds he needed, these were dead and gone. Our future lies buried. Oh crap. Well then, what is this? To spread out, on a weekly basis, our hordes will be able to scavenge together 350 units of melee weapons and 25 units of Pazumbjorn armor to be automatically added to our stockpiles. March of steel. Nomadic roots. Loot the land to live. Let the wastes grow. Loot the land to kill. Joined by the f beasts of flesh. Interesting. Joined by the beats of spirits. Weekly pony power plus 50. And he emerges. To march, darkness march. Motorized infantry. Finance their ambitions. Fuel their might. Wait. Minus 60% infantry equipment. Minus 30% total artillery. Feed their needs. You have more attack and defense. Roam even further. Yordic will assume the title of Lord of the Endless Waste. Setting on the path of the supremacy. What? Change the popularity of supremacy. 93.2% perfectly exactly. Chosen by the gods. A grim reminder. Learn how to smash all? Just five world goals. Spare the penguins. Exploit others. Well, there's, that's one route. Or we could do to move in. More organization. Plunder the ruins of armories. That's not bad. Of roads and iron. Of ice and iron. 
build new fortresses around the capital. Move population from the mountains. Move them, move them, move them, move them. The Iron City. The Oracle assumes instead of Iron Captain on the path of supremacy. So, both, so he has a good supremacist. If you go down this, these ways. Industrializing society, which would be better at an extensive conscription. The Army of the Captain. So those are those two options over here. And then we have the Desolated Lands of Sparta Falls. Abandon the Wastes. Uh, colonize Western Key Cities. Transport them to our capital. Reforge East into a fortress. Iron Capital. Uh, curious Offer. Get a research slot, that's good. Substantial Science Base, that's good. Depends what we want here. Industrializing, that's good. Another research slot. Make it down, get this stuff. Heretical models of production. Another research slot over here. So there's that stuff over there, or we can do a waste of our hours. Emerging from the fog, sort of the far Bell's border fortifications. So if we don't go down this way, we can't complete the arsenal. The few loyal and living that endure. Two military reformers still kicking. Industrial roaming around. Mechanites and a queen. Fruit of their labor, it's not bad. That should be good. A great push. Forge an action of shards. You get a research slot, and then complete the arsenal, industrializing. Um, honestly, construct a modern battle cruiser. 3% more population. It also does move its armor. And the mine that guides it all. That's actually pretty strong. So let me know which way we should go. I kind of want to see what this one is. Is it spread out? That seems like a lot of fun to do. Um, so let me know which way we should go. Because I'm open to whatever. I do not mind grabbing more stuff here first, especially that other research slot would be really nice. So, because how, how much does it take? Go there. Because it might just be easy to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, get down there. The greatest of ironies. Over time, Paul Wellington had dreamed of absolute control over the polar bear race. He proclaimed himself as a despot of all polar bears. He even sometimes imagined himself to be a grover the first figure. Yeah, for the polar bears, yet. For we hear the stories of the great conqueror Grafonia, for even in Vidina and Brandbeek Mountains, that they talk of this myth. And integral to all these dreams was the aspect of control. For no other leader had unified the state and race under his own control, like Grover the First. Yet the bears were not a race so easily subdued and overturned. Paul Wellington was forced to endlessly battle for control of them, and not literally then in the fields of politics and even economics. He now as holds lay destroyed, armies butchered, and noble and great leaders sent to rest beneath the snows and ice. As he discarded his foreign name and took his old one in shame, as he buried his hopes and dreams, and all that came to him and those that remained, those who dared to question him before those without clans that scoffed at his dreams. Now all that seemed to came to him, for trade routes had dried out, for his mines were collapsed, for root farms lay abandoned. They couldn't survive by themselves now, too, dependent on the peace he had brought merely years before. They needed him. They needed a tyrant that control all to save them. And with the bitterness over Paul Paul Wellington began to guide the realms of polar bears again. They sent without opposition without question. They finally admitted him as absolute. And yet now that the magic scribes were gone, the elders were gone, the proper smiths and shamans, the absolute powers he so created to uplift bears into a new age cut down by conditions. Even under his absolute rule, they wouldn't thrive. They could only perhaps survive. Is this a joke by Allfather? But I think we might have an owlbear. Um... What do we want to do first? I don't know which one we want to do so. Let me know which way we should go. Abandon the waste. The waste are ours versus to spread out and to move in. I kind of, for this campaign, really want to try out to spread out just to see what the darkness is like. So, but if we do that, we can do either one of these two routes. So if we go to the right side here, we can do this over here as well. These, regardless. So which is pretty good overall. Um, so let me know which way we should go. Because if we go this route, we should probably go the left way left way here too probably because it does does it link up no actually no it doesn't link up at all this is completely separate completely separate from these two so these two are independent so let me know which way we should go spread out let's move in as well as abandon the waste and the waste are ours so we should probably do if we do spread out we should probably do the waste are ours and do we move in we should abandon the wastes but we're going to forward an alliance or an action charge first probably because I want that research slide as fast as possible because going to this one is going to take uh quite a bit of time. So the suit of armor lays ruin, battered onto nothing but by brotherly war. The axe lay shattered, its blade unable to handle the strain, even the claws are blunted, yet if an ursine desires to move or survive, weapons must be sharpened and the armor reforged and the claws were grown. So we are not in a good position my friends. We have no consumer goods, we have nothing to work with, which really sucks, but if you enjoyed the video though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow to see what else we can do with Clan Skyfling, and maybe have some darkness. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of 
your day.